President Fauci, board members of the Norway Japan Society, dear friends of Japan and Norway. It is a great honor and pleasure to address you here tonight to talk about Norway's foreign policy. Japan was one of the first countries to recognize Norway when we gained complete independence in 1905. Our diplomatic um, relationship, in fact, goes even further back since there was at this time already a Norwegian-Swedish consulate established in Yokohama, primarily serving Norwegian shipping interests. The consul in Yokohama in 1905 happened to be a Norwegian and he simply remained in place. So our foreign policy relationship has been running a long time, although it has of course changed a great deal over these almost 120 years. Today, our contact points are many and our common foreign policy interests are wide, but in many interest instances, you will find that Norway's foreign policy and the core principles it is built on are well tuned to the values and foreign policies of Japan. This is an excellent foundation for our bilateral cooperation. Norwegian foreign policy is based on a set of core principles, which we can sum up in a number of values and interests. As for values, we believe in universal human rights, democracy, the rule of law, peaceful resolution of conflicts, and a strong foundation of international and humanitarian law. The UN Charter, treating all countries as equals, is fundamental. That we share these values with Japan creates strong trust between our two countries and enables us to work together as close partners on the basis of a rules-based global order. Norway's interests include protecting our borders, our autonomy, and our way of life, maintaining and strengthening political influence and economic security, and ensuring that the global developments are shaped by dialogue and multilateralism, not the use of force. Of course, our values and interests are intertwined. Our values shape our interests and our interests shape our values. In our foreign policy, we seek to consistently convey a few basic messages. One, Norway is a dependable and predictable member of the international community to create a rules-based international order, not, only, uh, not one entirely controlled by the countries with the biggest economic or military power, is essential for peaceful international cooperation. And Norway is ready to do its part to maintain this order. This also means that Norway is a reliable and consistent multilateral partner in international organizations, not least the UN. Norway also engages in a number of other global and regional organizations, and we seek to develop joint solutions and agreements and joint action to promote issues that are important to us all. Norway is an experienced negotiator for peace and reconciliation. As a small country with no colonial history and limited stake in global conflicts, we have developed a reputation as a nonpartisan and professional mediator. I will talk more on this later on. And fourth, Norway is an open economy, strongly supports a global inclusive trade system and emphasizes free and fair competition. A solid security policy, the basis for my country's foreign policy, and especially a geographically exposed one such as Norway. Being clear and predictable about our intentions and readiness, as well as being able to adapt to changing circumstances will always be key. Um, Norway is a small country in population, but with a land mass the size of Japan, and a very long and exposed coastline in the northwestern corner of Europe. We have a common border with Russia of about 200 kilometers on land in the north and adjoining sea territories. Norway was one of the founding members of NATO and you can see our foreign minister here uh, at a NATO meeting together with the foreign minister of Latvia, I believe. Um, <clears throat> and that was back in 1949. Uh, the alliance and the possibility of allied reinforcement should Norway be the target of aggression is the most important element in our security policy. Norway is itself an active member of the alliance, providing troops, strategic positioning and expertise. 
At the moment, for example, there are Norwegian troops stationed in Lithuania, and the Secretary General of the organization is former Prime Minister of Norway, Jens Stoltenberg. In recent years, the defense cooperation between the Nordic countries has also developed very much, including Sweden and Finland, who are not NATO members, but close partners of the alliance. There are no foreign bases or troops permanently stationed in Norway. And since 1950s, it has been a clear principle that nuclear weapons are not to be placed in Norway in peacetime. There are well-developed systems in place for reinforcing Norwegian conventional defense, however, should the need arise. Also, there are frequent allied exercises in Norway and our country provides excellent training facilities for mountain, sea and air training and unique opportunities for winter training, something many of our allies regularly make use of. Just now, the exercise cold response is going on, postponed from last year, with up to 30,000 uh, NATO soldiers engaged uh, from a number of countries, plus Finland and Sweden. Norway has the common border with Russia and keeping border relations orderly, predictable and peaceful is of great importance. Our core strategy in this is deterrence and reassurance. We are non-aggressive, but willing to defend ourselves. After the end of the Cold War, a lot of programs were developed to enhance cooperation with Russian communities and the people-to-people -people engagement. Sadly, this is now on hold for the foreseeable future in view of the developments in Russia. Although some activities primarily related to the orderly maintenance of the border itself, will still be maintained. Uh, this slide is kind of self-explanatory, I think. The 24th of February this year, Russia began a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And this aggression, which has now been going on for a month, marked the start of a political and humanitarian crisis that Europe has not seen the likes of since the 1990s with the Balkan Wars. Norway stands firmly with Ukraine. Norway has responded to the crisis with coordinated economic sanctions and strong political condemnation of Russia. An attack on Ukraine is not only an attack on this country, but an attack on the fundamentals of the international order. Norway has adopted all of the sanctions agreed upon by the EU countries as Norwegian law, and our largest investors in Russia, such as our sovereign wealth fund and the energy company Equinor, are all, all divesting from Russia completely. Norway has so far set aside 230 million US dollars, or more precisely 2 billion Norwegian kroner, for humanitarian assistance. Half of it is already being dispersed, and it might not be enough. We are also prepared to receive and protect large numbers of Ukrainian refugees. In the course of these first few weeks, 3 million of the country's 44 million inhabitants have already fled the country. Norway is uh, not a neighboring country and has so far received about 3,000. We are already prepared for 30,000, but there might be even more. Throughout this crisis, we have emphasized that the situation in Ukraine is a global challenge and not only a regional one. The challenge to the very autonomy of the Ukraine state, posed by Russia under President Putin and demonstrated by the invasion of an aggression against this country, go straight to the basic principles of the UN Charter. The United Nations remains an incredibly important arena for interaction between countries. Norway is dependent on a strong and united international order, and the UN is the most important platform for securing and defending it. As such, it is natural that Norway not only takes part, but also actively promotes the use of the UN and its institutions. The UN has never functioned as the world police and has never been immune to disruptions by major powers, of course. However, it is a vitally important forum for formulating the will of the world community and shaping joint action to promote its principles. Norway is currently halfway through 
a two-year term as an elected member of the UN Security Council. We had several goals for our membership period to emphasize peace diplomacy, the inclusion of women, protection of civilians, and climate change. Reforming the UN, making the organization more efficient and attuned to the world of today was also high on our agenda. Of course, in preparing for our membership, little did we know that a global pandemic would block the very meeting places of the organization or that a war in Europe would challenge it to the core. But weathering the storms of the world has always been what the UN is about. And for Norway, our membership of the Council is an important opportunity to promote Norwegian values and interests by keeping the UN institutions relevant and strong. And in fact, a number of the declared Norwegian priorities have been very relevant also in today's situation, including in conflicts which do not always reach the headlines and where Norway has taken an important uh, tasks while in the Council such as being a pen holder in Afghanistan or chairing the North Korea Sanctions Committee. Disarmament and non-proliferation of nuclear weapons will continue to be high on Norway's priority list based on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. European politics and the relationship to the European Union of course, plays a key role in Norwegian foreign policy. The EU is our biggest trading partner and we very often align with EU countries in our foreign policy. Norway is not a member of the European Union. However, we are a part of the European Economic Area and the Schengen Area. This means that the rules and the regulations for businesses and individuals are the same also in Norway as in the EU countries and that you can freely travel in the whole area. About 70% of our trade is with the EU countries, and many young Norwegians take part of their education in other European countries on the basis of well-developed exchange programs, for example. In addition to this, Norway is an active member of the World Trade Organization, the OECD, and we have established bilateral and multilateral trade agreements with many countries of the world. Uh, alone or as a member of the EFTA together with Switzerland, Iceland and Liechtenstein. We would also very much like to enter into negotiations on the free trade agreement with Japan. For us, Japan is the missing piece in our free trade agreement in this region and Norway is in Japan, uh, as Norway is in Japan's agreements with European countries. As one of the Nordic countries, Norway has put considerable effort into maintaining good ties with our neighbors. Most importantly, the Nordic Council and the Nordic Council of Ministers has been the basis of a very close cooperation with Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Sweden, and their territories. In fact, the Helsinki Agreement on cooperation between the Nordic countries celebrates its 60th anniversary this very day. In 2022, uh, Norway chairs the Nordic Council of Ministers. This is an arena for cooperation for our cabinet ministers in different fields, as well as an arena for promotion and improvement of the Nordic model, sharing experiences, establishing cooperation projects, big and small, and promoting Nordic culture. A joint aim is to make the Nordic region the greenest, most innovative, competitive, and socially sustainable region in the world by 2030. For several decades, Norway has been deeply invested in peace and reconciliation work in all over the world. Over the last 30 years, we have gained unique experience from wildly differing conflict situations. Norway is a small country in population and the size of our institutions and the distance is short between our authorities and civil society organizations, for example. This has often been useful in such situations because they often have expertise that we can draw upon. We do not always succeed in our mediation efforts, but then this would also be quite unreasonable expectation in deeply embedded conflict situations. A long-term commitment is often key to progress. 
Among other initiatives, our mediation efforts have included Colombia, Venezuela, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines. The Women, Peace, and Security Agenda has been an important part of Norwegian foreign policy ever since we championed this UN Security Council resolution, task number 1325, in October year 2000. It was no coincidence that we brought this issue to the fore during the Norwegian presidency in the Security Council in January this year. Our initiative was to promote and share information about the effect of active and equal participation by women, especially in peacekeeping and conflict mediation processes and in the implementation of peace agreements. While conflict mediation is important, we also engage in protecting civilians during ongoing armed conflicts. The main focus is then to lessen civilian casualties, protect particularly vulnerable groups, and to secure access to education for children. Along with our commitment to peace, Norway is deeply dedicated to international development cooperation. Norway gives more than 1% of its gross national income as aid for countries in need. This amounts to more than 4.6 billion US dollars annually, so it's quite uh, an important sum, even in absolute terms. 51% of our aid is given through various UN programs and organizations, since we consider this to be most efficient for us as well as the recipients, and it also serves to strengthen international cooperation. This commitment makes Norway one of the biggest aid donors in the world. The development aid, which does not go through the UN institutions, is mostly provided through the World Bank and various non-governmental organizations across the world. Our development cooperation priorities include health, education for girls, food security, humanitarian assistance, and economic development. Africa is the biggest recipient of Norwegian development assistance, followed by the Middle East, South Asia, and the ASEAN region, and Latin America. Poverty alleviation has always been the priority, uh, thus the focus on sub-Saharan Africa. Today, sustainable development um, and the SDGs are at the heart of everything we do, including our development policy. Climate and environment is a crucial component of Norwegian foreign policy today. We're committed to the Paris Accord, and we have worked hard to make multilateral and national climate protection regimes as stringent as possible in Europe and globally. Our goal is to reduce our national carbon emissions by 55% before 2030 and become a low carbon society by 2050. In order to pursue these goals, Norway has taken a holistic approach. Nearly all electricity production in Norway already comes from green energy production, especially hydropower. The most important remaining emissions in Norway from fossil fuels are from the transportation sector and the industrial sector. And the government has established a number of programs to reduce them. The most well-known example is from the transportation sector Norway is transitioning to electric cars. And today, more than 65% of all new cars are fully electric. The Norwegian parliament has decided that all new cars should be electric by 2025. But there is still room for improvement also in other sectors, such as the building sector, for example, by the reuse of buildings and building materials. In fact, concrete is extremely costly to produce in terms of energy and in heating. Internationally, we are a technological entrepreneur with carbon capture and storage, as well as renewable technologies such as offshore wind and blue and green hydrogen schemes. Both are very relevant for cooperation with Japan as well. We also have invested heavily in assisting countries with tropical rainforests to establish consistent policies to protect them since they are vital to the global climate. In our development cooperation, helping to establish climate-friendly energy industries is key. Norway holds a privileged position because of our petroleum reserves. 
and we have a heavy responsibility to advance renewable energy and managing the transition to a sustainable energy future for us all. At the same time, we continue to serve as an important and reliable energy provider, especially to other European countries. The integrated power net of Northern Europe helps facilitate the rapid introduction of renewable energy sources, such as wind and solar energy. Russia's war against Ukraine has put this process under even stronger pressure than before, since all European countries will want to reduce their dependence on Russian energy sources as quickly as possible. Being a country with a long coastline and huge marine territory and significant interests in the maritime economy, Norway is deeply invested in international ocean issues. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea from 1982 is of crucial importance to a country like Norway with our long coastline and large economic zones. The Law of the Sea provides rules and regulations of the ocean space and human activities there. With its complex ecosystems and abundance of resources, the ocean remains extremely important for the Norwegian people. The sea is the arena where a large part of Norwegian economic activity takes place, from oil and gas extraction to fishing and fish farming. It is the home for nearly all Norwegians. 80% in fact of Norwegians live in towns, villages and homesteads along the coastline. And it is a source of well-being and recreation, both for organized activities and the enjoyment of wild and unspoiled nature. However, all of this is today under great pressure, as is the case all over the world. This is why we took the initiative to establish the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, promoting a holistic approach to the ocean space with the main message being that we need to protect the ocean and manage all our activities there in a coordinated way if we are to preserve it as a source for our food and income in the future. The members of the panel, among them Japan, have committed to managing all of their own coastal and ocean resources by 2025 and aiming for an international agreement where 30% of the world's oceans will be protected by specific regimes. Fisheries management, for example, is part of this. And Norwegian fisheries have during the last decades been transformed from a subsidized industry undermining its own resource base to one of our main export industries. Indeed, fish and seafood constitute a large part of Norwegian exports to the Japan. Rigorous science-based management has been instrumental in achieving this although it still uh, is a very challenging prospect to be able to manage uh, ocean resources properly. Moving further north, the Arctic is of huge importance for Norway. A large part of our country, in fact, lies north of the Arctic Circle, and about 10% of Norway's inhabitants live there. Our Arctic policy is to promote and maintain Norwegian interests in the Arctic, while further strengthening cooperation with the other Arctic nations. Achieving a sustainable balance between economic activity and environmental protection is in the Arctic region is key. And tight collaboration, exchange of knowledge and innovation between Arctic nations is the best way to achieve it. Today, climate change is, most obvious, uh, is the most obvious challenge in the Arctic with receding ice and temperature rising more quickly there than anywhere else in the world. It is perhaps tempting to see this as an issue which primarily consists in protecting the Arctic itself from human activity taking place there. But in fact, climate change knows no borders, knows no Arctic circles. It affects us all and is caused by human activity everywhere on the globe. The Arctic Council is the most important collaborative platform we have in the region. It is a body where our challenges having to do with nature preservation, economic activity and people living in the region are discussed and deliberated to find common solutions. Of course, the cooperation we had developed with Russia in this context over decades will now have to be reconsidered as so many of our cooperation mechanisms. 
To wrap up this presentation and sum up what Norwegian politicians and diplomats seek to convey as far as foreign policy is concerned, it is consistency. Norway's foreign policy might be wide reaching and complex, but our core principles, democracy, human rights, rule of law, a deep commitment to sustainability and promoting equality and inclusion, they ensure continuity. This is why the question I received along with the invitation to talk to you about highlighting what is new in Norwegian policy with the new government that was established last October is in fact answered in this way. Agreement on the major foreign policy interests and values of Norway is broad and strong. Ch changes happen over time, of course, but they are really caused more by changing circumstances than by major shifts in policy lines. The change in governments nearly always happens completely seamlessly in Norway when it comes to foreign policy, which is, of course, a great strength when we seek to project, project ourselves as a predictable and reliable partner. Also, uh, any government in Norway would make a point of informing all political parties in parliament about its assessments and intentions in foreign policy on a regular and general basis, such as our foreign minister did yesterday, in fact, and in specific cases. Today, the worsening security situation on the European continent has primary importance for Norwegian foreign policy, with the consequences of China's growth in the world economy and policies coming in as a second determining factor. I believe that both the former and the current governments would be in very close agreement on this. And in response to the Ukraine crisis, the Norwegian foreign policy remained on track with the government as well as the opposition stating firmly that we do not tolerate transgressions of human rights and breaches to international law. Moving forward as well, Norway will stand by its principles and work for a collaborative and strong international order. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ambassador uh, Nihaman. This is uh, perhaps the most uh, extensive and uh, the most timely lecture we had uh, at our general meeting of the Norway Japan Society. Um, it was uh, a comprehensive and deeply uh, educating uh, story, uh, taking us through the important uh, factors of Norway's core principles, our Norwegian uh, values and Norwegian interests in the foreign policies, the security policies, and uh, Norwegian's role in, Norway's, uh, role in uh, NATO, the timely topic of Ukraine, the developing political and humanitarian uh, crisis that is occurring. And of course, then in that respect, Norway's uh, humanitarian, humanitarian uh, assistance and uh, activities. Also to, to note uh, Norway uh, supporting UN as a platform for upholding the international uh, order. Also important information about Norway's relation to the European Union, our partner for trade, and also important destination for our uh, students and and uh, for education. A uh, free trade agreement with Japan, uh, one of our uh, missing piece in uh, the free trade agreements uh, between Norway and countries uh, in this region. Also an insight into the uh, Norwegian participating, participation uh, to Nordic cooperation. 
and about Norway's commitment to peace and also international development assistance activities. Of course, a shared challenge for us all, uh, the climate and environmental issues and how Norway is engaging in tackling those on an international scene. So thank you very much. And of course, uh, for such an engaging lecture, we also have questions. And I would like to invite uh, Ambassador back uh, and we will uh, share some of the questions we have received uh, from our members, uh, both uh, in advance and also during the, the session. Okay. So maybe you can just read out the question. And I'll try to answer it. Well, if I can. <laughs> yeah. The first uh, question is uh, from Idemitsu Koso. The question reads, the recent shift to decarbonization is the most important issue. We also believe that contributing to the society through stable supply of energy is our important mission. I believe it is possible to strike a good balance between the two needs and to cope with both. What do you, do you think? Well, I think uh, Idemitsu Kosan in that formulation has uh, grasped uh, very important points in the Norwegian energy policy. Um, we are very strongly in favor of uh, decarbonizing uh, not only Norway, but the world, but uh, pr primarily by uh, reducing the demand for fossil energy through developing renewable energy and uh, also, of course, through energy uh, efficiency. Um, and I think uh, all energy companies now see this happening. Indeed, it uh, caused Statoil to rename itself into Equinor and engage very strongly uh, in the renewable sector. Uh, for example, that's what they do here in Japan. Uh, but also for Norway as a government, we continue to serve as a reliable energy provider for the European countries not least uh, in, turf, in uh, providing natural gas. And that will, of course, continue. But uh, at the same time, we commit ourselves to reducing our own consumption of fossil fuels and expect others to do the same. Thank you very much. I have another question. Uh, as uh, one of our online attendees is asking, uh, what is the situation of the movement of young people uh, criticizing lack of stronger efforts for preventing global warming? Um, and uh, how can young people be more engaged in these uh, uh, international kind of efforts? I think uh, many young people in Norway are very uh, engaged in, uh, in uh, this, um, this issue. Uh, Norwegians are also very fond of getting organized, uh, and they do. And the Norwegian government is very open to engaging with uh, voluntary organizations and do that on a regular basis. So I don't think they feel they have a problem of access. It's a natural part of our political system. Thank you very much again, uh, Ambassador uh, Nihama, uh, for your uh, lecture today. A pleasure. Thank you very much, and good luck with the rest of your meeting. Thank you.